Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Shelly Aldridge with Urban Associates. And, and I'm Melissa Lieb with Lieb and Associates. And we have here Tim Skelfi. Uh, we're so excited to have you on here. Tim Skelfi is the Director of the Interior Design at BSB De Designs in Charlotte. It's a national architecture and interior firm with about 12 locations. Wow, I did not realize you had 12 offices located throughout the U.S. So you concentrate or work focused mainly on housing, design, including multi-student, an important one now, senior living, community design, that's, that's a huge one, and single family residential. Tim's based in Charlotte, North Carolina office of BSB. Previ previously, just some background on Tim, uh, he has worked in Austin, Texas, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Washington, D.C. metro area, uh, where he was born and raised. Uh, Tim is a fellow of the American Society of Interior Designers, NCIDQ, certified and licensed interior designer. Tim has been awarded with over 40 design awards for his work, including hospitality, commercial, residential, and multi-design projects. It's amazing. Tim has served twice as the ASID National Board of Directors and over 10 years on the Board of Directors for the ASID Carolinas Chapters in 2007 as the ASAD Carolina's chapter president. It's great. Tim lives in Charlotte now. We're glad to have you back with his wife, Ruth Ann, and often travels for work and for pleasure. Tim's traveled throughout Italy, China, Sweden, Austria, and the Caribbean. That's so great too. And funds travels as a way of experience different cultures and design to true. Tim is currently writing a book with congratulations on his career and his journey in the design and looking forward to having it published in 2023. That's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for jumping on with us this morning. Well, absolutely, Shelly. Thank you. Melissa, thank you as well. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. So as you know, as I told you, we concentrate on lighting and I think my, throughout my career, you've known that's been where I have focused on that. So it was good to have you on here from a designer standpoint with all the avenues that you've designed on to kind of bring some presence to that and get some feedback from you on that. So anyways, so would you like to give us a little bit in case some of our listeners don't know a little bit about the ASIT or, you know, about the multi-housing, would you like to start a little bit about what you do? I know I described it, but. Yeah. So I, I am a director of interior design for BSB design. As you said, um, we're a national firm. We have 12 offices around the country. And uh, for the last uh, several years, um, our interior design studio has been based solely in Charlotte. About a year and a half ago, we acquired another firm, a third office now in California that has interior designers as well. So now we're represented on the East Coast and West Coast with interior design. Um, but we've got a great team of designers in our Charlotte office, as well as architects. We've got about um, 30 architects and uh, a handful of interior designers, a good studio. Uh, it's funny, most of our work right now is not even in the Carolinas. We're working on projects in Texas, in Florida, uh, in, um, in Alabama, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Sacramento, California. So what's good about working for a national firm is a lot of our projects are around the country as interior designers. We get to work in a lot of different buckets. Um, the firm focuses uh, mostly on housing. It's a 60-year-old firm. We've been around 60 years. Um, for architecture, interiors is only about five years old for our firm, so relatively young on the interior design side. Uh, but we focus on housing, uh, a lot of multifamily housing, uh, both uh, you know low rise to mid rise to high rise multifamily. Uh, we also do student housing design. We've done quite a lot of that around the country, and senior living. Uh, we're also doing a lot of single family. That's kind of the roots of where the company started was single family design. We do a lot of work with some very large national developers. And uh, the newest market that's really kind of taken off over the past uh, year or several years now, but really it's pretty strong, is built for rent single family, uh, where people okay. are building uh, single family communities that are for rent. So we're doing a lot, of, it's a, lot of, a lot of those as well. So a little bit of background of it, what we're doing right now. That's awesome. So you normally, as an architect and the designer, you work for the developers of these, right? Yeah, so they our, our clients are, are usually the developers. Um, and, uh, um, you know, on the single family side, even that right now is is the developers. In a, pre, in a previous life, 
Um, I worked with homeowners uh, directly. Uh, you know, when I was in Raleigh for years, I did a lot of custom residential design uh, before kind of moving on to the multifamily side of design and, and more of the commercial uh, part of what we do. And, you know, and on the multifamily side, again, whether it's market rate, student housing or senior housing, we're doing the amenity areas, we're doing the clubhouses, we're doing um, all the business offices in these buildings, and we're doing the residential units as well. So we get to see it uh, uh, both sides of the house where people live and, and where they, you know, where, where their home is, and then also their amenity where they might, you know, choose to kind of play and um, and have some business opportunities there and use the amenities as well. Well, it's a huge spectrum on that. So knowing that we're concentrating lighting, I'm just in my head going, wow, the spectrum on the lighting and the Kelvins and everything changes mm -hmm. from space to space. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. But being on that design part of it, you know, and calling on specifiers like yourself, you know, myself and Melissa concentrate solely on lighting, but I know you've got flooring and wall covering and furniture and so much to do. But, you know, we find that, you know, our tendency is to think that lighting can make or break a space. You know, anything below the ceiling we consider to be jewelry or kind of more like the eye candy. And then everything mm -hmm. abo above the ceiling, more of the functional and I'm um, highlighting the rest of it. So just kind of curious when you start your design process and when you're getting to the lighting part of this, um, and you can expand on this, is it something that comes in first or is it something that when you're designing that you find that you're designing first and then you do the lighting? Well, I guess you have to because of color renderings and stuff, but you know, on the decorative side of that, um, do the developers kind of come to you or give you free reign? You kind of, I mean, everywhere that you're designing obviously has different styles Correct. that they're going for, right? Mm -hmm. So. Well, the lighting, the lighting design um, from a, a functional need is something that we have to focus on actually very early in the process. Um, we work with a lot of um, MEP engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, and um, you know we have to actually do our lighting design very, very early in the process because the drawings have to be coordinated with our MEP engineers and the architectural teams. So um, the lighting is thought of early, I mean, when we're actually doing the initial design of the project, not so much necessarily maybe the selection of the fixtures, although we do do that, um, but architectural placement, because we have to worry about or think about, I should say, lighting design and then the mechanical systems and making sure we've got enough ceiling heights and making sure that we don't have to drop any soffits and things like that. So we, um, we do think of lighting early um, and you know, you think of it from a functionally standpoint of, okay, how are we going to light the space to make it um, mm -hmm. either, you know, just to function for the whatever the use is, whether it's a home or an office or something more hospitality driven, but then also aesthetically, what kind of effect is the lighting going to give to the space and how is that going to increase or decrease the design that you're doing? So lights, lighting is an important part. Um, even more so these days, you know, all the studies about how light impacts mood and psyche and uh, the physiology of the body and, and whatnot. So it's very important that that lighting is thought of early on. And it's not just a decorative thing. It's a function, functional thing as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you, um, when you're picking that up, when you, I work with MEPs all the time too, just on the specifications, mm -hmm. what's new? Because we're evolving. Some people would say we're in a lighting revolution right now. Things are changing. It's um, probably changing more faster, more rapidly and than it was since the invention of like a metal halide. So do you really like your lighting reps that come in? Because I know that you have them call on you because I've called on you for years too. Do you depend on them only solely for the decorative? But obviously when as a designer, I've often wondered this, do you depend on the um, engineers for the architectural and you just kind of give them the effect or do you kind of know what aesthetically architecturally you'd like and then they incorporate that in? Well, I really like um, lighting reps and uh, manufacturers like yourself, Shelly, that, you know, not only provide us the information on the decorative lighting, but training. Uh, like you said, with the lighting, I remember, you know, I started when they did, you know, incandescent and then fluorescent was all the rage. And then we changed to, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, halogen and then we changed to LED you know, just when you thought you had one system figured out, then they come up with LED, which is great because you can do a lot with LED. It's energy yeah. efficient and there's lots of different opportunities for different type of lighting effects. But, you know, just like being spread, for instance, and what your foot yeah. cam on the space is going to be, 
you know, having that training as a designer to, to know that you need 35 foot candles on a work surface or, you know, to light a hallway um, is really, really important. So I do rely on you guys to help train us um, as much as you can and the information that you have from your manufacturers. So, you know, we really like getting lighting CEUs and seminars, not only about what's new in decorative lighting, but um, how lighting actually works and what what it does. You know, you right. talk about CRI, the color rendering index, and, you know, people look at a lamp, but the CRI can be different. And if you're in your 90s or 95 range, you know, you're going to get good color rendition, which is so important for a space as well. So oh. I, I look at it for both sides of the house. Right, right. Okay. Well, that's really great. Um, do you see any trends right now that you think, because I mean, I, I look at assisted living, which is just, um, it's, it's, it's a huge market right now. Um, and there's everything with assisted living from even dementia patients, Alzheimer's, if they're, if they're in there. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get, you jump over to where, where our generation and younger, I'll say our generation, are living <laughs> in the, you know, apartment complexes and what their trends tend to be. Cause I feel like 10 years, five years, even five years ago, multi-housing was designed much differently now than it was then because it's work, live, play a right. lot. Oh, and then you've got the assisted living where they have um, color temperatures with their health and that right. type of thing. So um, what are you seeing trending right now in that? We'll go, we'll just stick with the multi-housing right now since yeah. I kind of jumped there. Well, I, no, I mean, I think depending on the end user, you know, you have right. to keep in mind, you know, is it an older population or, you know, because as you age, your eyesight changes and your need for lighting changes quite differently than when you're younger. Um, on the multifamily side, because we do a lot of amenity design with our clubhouses and our, um, our cafes and lounges, you know, it's, it's dramatic too. So we have to create a mood and an atmosphere which is gonna be inviting because um, a lot of the developers are using these amenities to help sell the lifestyle that the uh, residents are gonna have. Um, but, you know, uh, the biggest, I wouldn't call it a trend, but I guess the biggest shift is happened in um, housing is because of COVID, um, working from home. You know, yep. that, that is a thing, I mean, I'm doing it right now. Well, you know, we're talking from my home versus my office. And, you know, and, and three or four years ago, we didn't even really know what all that was. So, you know, now we're doing this. So a lot of our um, amenities are, you know, we're business centers, we're starting to shrink. Now they're coming back. We're also thinking about how we can design uh, places in the residential units, the, the apartments, where mm -hmm. people can stay from stay and work from home. Do you need a little desk area? Okay, so you have a desk. What kind of lighting is in that area? You know, sure. everybody's gonna have to buy a lamp or it, can you provide a little recessed lamp or a wall sconce or something like that that will provide lighting, the correct lighting for someone to work from home. So um, that's probably been the biggest shift in our industry is just working from home and adopting to that new reality. Um, you know, still like being in the office, we still have that kind of working in the office and also working from home flexibility. But, um, you know, people and businesses um, need to be that that flexible. Right. I've heard um, when speaking with um, some of the multi-housing specifiers that I work with, including that 2,700, which is so odd because it took so long to perfect the 3,000 and everybody was just mainstream 3,000, 3,000. But I've heard there's this huge trend towards 2,700, not only in the functional lighting, but also making sure if it is a screw in aftermarket lamp, that it definitely is provided at 2700 K yeah. and that think that's just, it goes back to creating a mood and also um, relaxing. To me, it feels more of a spa, a little bit more luxury when you walk into a space and you're not underneath the 3000 K or above. And so are you seeing no, the development? Funny. Well, so we coming back to Charlotte, we, 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 we bought a house, moved to our house and we had probably, I think, I don't know, 40 different recessed can lights in our house. And, of course, they were reflector bulbs and they were, you know, not very good color. So the first thing I went out, I, I took out all the recessed lights and I, I, just the bulbs, just the lamps. And I went out and I bought LED lamps and they were 2700 K. And because I wanted that warm, inviting feeling to the house, it instantly changed the feeling of our home. And I walk around our neighborhood and I still see some people that have the 3000 or even, uh, God forbid, like 4000 or something where it looks like a hospital. Uh, and great for hospital environments, but not for residential. So the um, 
the color temperature is really an important thing. And one thing in multifamily, some mistakes I see, you know, we have these long hallways and these long corridors. So in a corridor, you have your general lighting, which is in the ceiling, and that's lighting the, the ambient lighting, giving the overall effect for the corridors. But then you might have a wall sconce at each unit entrance. And I see all the time how the ambient lighting might be, I don't know, above 3000 K and the sconces are 2700 K. And in the same hallway, you've got different colors going on that, that changes the wall colors, the, the textures. It's a mess. And that's one of the biggest faults I see with manufacturers and designers when they don't think about the different types of light sources and the light it's putting out. Absolutely. And, you know, different manufacturers, they have a binding process that's slightly off. How important is it? Is it, are you seeing that people are preferring like an integrated, as it's getting perfected, an integrated LED? Or in those common areas, do you still prefer, I know the architectural a lot of times is integrated. On the decorative, are you still seeing a lot of where they want to do the screw in light bulbs? Um yeah, you know, and again, with LED technology, which has been fantastic and is probably going to, you know, continue to improve. But, you know, uh, we have rated corridors, meaning that they have to be fire rated, usually a two hour assembly in, in the ceiling or something like that. And, you know, when you start penetrating the ceiling, you've got to you've got to have light boxes or light, you know, enclosures that allow that fire rating to be maintained. So by having these LED fixtures, which are super thin, and you can attach them to the ceiling plane without penetrating the ceiling, that's huge. So, you know, LED has given us opportunities to create more types of lighting and different types of lighting environments without necessarily affecting, you know, any fire ratings or other things like that. So, I mean, you still have to be careful and you still have to look for it, but, um, you know, it's given us more opportunities. So it's really exciting what LED is doing and changing how we can use lighting. Right. And, you know, and just having the flexibility of it and like that fire rated, I think it's exciting to see now that we are coming out or factories are coming out with recessed cans now so that you don't have to break the plane where it's obvious that already have the built in fire rating, which is right. nice yes. because you still, it doesn't break that ceiling plane and you can keep the decorative for that part of it. So yeah. that's kind of interesting on there and just having the dimming. Um, because I'm seeing on a lot of schedules nowadays, um, because we still have more decorative that I would say we still have more decorative that where you have to screw in a lamp and I'm seeing it called out 2,700 K. I think mm -hmm. that's great. Do you ever get requested or do you ever think that, okay, we need to go ahead and specify which lamp manufacturer we want to make sure it's consistent, or is it just kind of like, you know, that the 27s are going to pretty fall in good hue. And they do. Yeah. I, used, I used to. I'll be honest with you. I, I used to, uh, you know, back in the halogen days and in the incandescent days, I used to actually specify the lamp and the manufacturer of the lamp. I've gotten away from that a little bit and maybe just relying on the technology. So I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, you know, and then we have our go-tos as far as who we like to use for different types of lighting fixtures and, and lamps, and they perform really well. And, you know, going to lighting shows and, and, uh, you know, different types of HD or BDNY, things like that, where you, there's manufacturers out there or light fair things, you know, where you can see, um, see the types of lighting and the quality of lamp that you're providing as well as good. Uh, but right now I don't have a, a specific manufacturer that I use. Yet. And I don't see a lot of that. That's why I was asking you, I just see the, the Kelvin. So that's why I was wondering, I don't see a whole lot yeah. of that on yeah. there, but as a lighting, you know, as a lighting rep that calls on you and does that, is there anything that you as a, is it across the board that you're asked for? Is there, a, or do you have, and you don't have to mention them, but do you have go-to manufacturers that you always know, okay, they're going to have quality, they're going to deliver this, that, and the other, or is it just kind of like getting on the internet or relying on your reps and just kind of across the board? I mean, I think just like any product, um, you know, designers have their go-tos, whether it's flooring or furniture or lighting, you know, things like that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of it, um, well, a lot of it depends on the product. Obviously, you've got to have good product, but then you also have to have a good rep, you know, mm -hmm. someone that's going to call on you and be consistent and be there, um, you know, for the technology and, um, you know, the ordering, when you start getting an ordering fixtures, you know, we do a lot of specification where we're not purchasing the fixtures because some of our projects literally have hundreds, if not thousands of fixtures, you know, one, sure. one uh, student housing project might have, you know, three or 400 units and each unit might have 
several beds in them. So, you know, think about all the rooms that could be a thousand different light fixtures in one project. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on. So, you know, we we don't have our go to's, but I mean, we do have our go to's, but I think it's important to have a rep that is um, is responsive, uh, who calls on you, has a technical ability as well as providing good product. Yeah. OK, that makes total sense, because I'm like, again, just the education part of it and the CEUs on it, because it just changes constantly. Um, I know I'm seeing a trend or I, I, I wanted to see, do you like to do a lot of custom? I know this is kind of going over, but I'm seeing this trend in like public areas, especially in the entry, like, you know, the atriums when you walk in or maybe the fitness room. I'm seeing a big thing in the fitness room. Or anything like that where you want to do more systems or possibly do more custom. Because I think the custom's fun mm -hmm. and um, doesn't necessarily go through what we call that VE process quite as sure. fast. Because we started on the beginning. Do you like to do a lot of the custom fixtures? Uh, off and on. And I think it's more in special areas, like you said, where you might have a, a larger entry or a specialty feature. You know, the word custom tends to scare people. Um, it definitely, like scares, <laughs> it definitely <laughs> scares our developers, you know, because they're going to think, oh, my gosh, this is that means money, you know, through the roof. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that, though. So mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, creating something unique and something that's a a a, a placemaker uh, mm -hmm. for a project is, is a good idea. Um, you know, and again, having a great manufacturer that you can work with and and right. it's easy to do and it's not if it becomes a headache it's not fun if it becomes easy it's it's fun and you know the more the less stress you can add to it the the better for the overall um use and the use by the designer right well i mean i've touched a lot i mean on the lighting part of it but as far as doing the designs and what you do what is your favorite part of that just the entire project um oh boy that's a that's a big question um you know, often we're, we're involved early in the process where there's sure. a, a developer and, you know, we have these visioning sessions and we like to be involved with the architects, you know, since we're an integrated firm with architecture and interiors, literally right next to me in the next office down is, is one of our senior architects. So we work to, you know, closely together. Um, but, you know, being involved in that process early on is fun because that's where a lot of the creativity happens. And and then you move into more of, um, you know, designing the, uh, developing the design and then moving into construction documents. You know, I, I, it sounds crazy, but I really like the whole process. I mean, I certainly like, you know, the end result when you see the yeah. finished product. And, you know, you mentioned VE. Um, I don't know if you've <laughs> heard invented that word, but they need to go away. Uh, yeah. Value engineering, you know, where, I, you know, I guess there's value to it because it's saving costs, but you know, it, it is a thing. It's a reality. Obviously um, there's a budget and there is a, a need uh, for uh, a performance of somebody selling that product to somebody else. And, you know, so, but I always think let's go back to our reps when we're specifying a product. If there's VE involved, don't just have the contractor or somebody else arbitrarily make those changes I always say fight for your design. So oh. go back to your, your manufacturer and say, okay, we can't spend $1,500 on this fixture. Is there a way to VE the fixture? Or do you have an alternate selection that we can get it for $1,200 or something right. like that? You know, let's try to make that work because you guys work hard for what you do. And, you know, and when we work on a design, we already have something in mind. So getting your feedback and your assistance uh, is a help, not a hindrance. So, um, I always like to go back to you guys. And it's really great as a representative of lighting to be in on the beginning, because when we take these plans, because I know you can't call your rep every time you're specifying them or using it, that just takes too much time. But if we are in on the beginning part of it, we already know quantities. We've already spoken with the factory. We already know we're going to try to do some kind of discount where, you know, we're going to do mass quantity on that. Or if it's working with a developer, you know, that they're going to do three or four different projects. We're going to try to mimic some things so we can already get that pricing control and try to be involved with that because we are also involved with the suppliers. So we can all really tend to work more as a team to get the project done for you. And that's where the electrical and the MEPs come in too, because we have some great lighting engineers that really try to hold it as much as possible and get and keep you all involved in that. Um, but going over, so we're going to switch a little bit from multi-housing because I know here in the Carolinas, we do, if we have time, mm -hmm. um, we do have a lot of senior living. And I feel like senior living, again, just like multi-housing is coming 
is coming around to be a little bit more, maybe not as institutional. Totally. Are you finding that? Oh my gosh, yes, yeah. And <laughs> um, I've done um, several multi, uh, some multifamily, several senior living projects here in the Carolinas um, and elsewhere, uh, a few others too. So familiar with the senior living, you know, it's it's amenity rich right now and, and will continue to be that. You know, um, the uh, baby boomer population is the largest retiring population and, and most wealthy population in the history of the United States. You know, so the people are used to, um, myself included, you know, a certain lifestyle and, and, and things and as far as amenities. So um, they're very amenity rich, you know, there's lounges, there's cafes, there's, um, you know, even um, hair salons and, and spas and things like that. And, um, you know, if you're uh, able to, um, you know, be independent and have a great lifestyle, but maybe not worry about having a home where you have to take care of everything and, you know, cut the grass every day and do all that. Um, you know, these, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to call them senior living, you know, they're more, um, you know, they're, they're lifestyle kind of projects. I know that there's a lot of different developers focusing on this. Um, again, it's, it's a, it's a huge market. Um, it's going to continue to grow and flourish. Um, I see them both in the city areas of, of different, you know, cities that I've traveled and I see them more suburban as well. So, um, there's lots of different product, but yeah, it, it's very amenity rich, uh, with a lots of different amenities and hence the lighting needs for those are, are pretty strong as well. Yeah. Because that goes right back into the aging eyes. There's going to be 2,700, but then again, um, aging eyes is an epidemic that we, well, I didn't, I didn't wear glasses until I was in my forties. I won't tell you how old I am right now, but you know, um, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't have these on initially year, years ago. So as we get older, we, we definitely, our eyes change. Yeah. I know. I mean, I remember, I remember the exact day that I had to actually go like that and realize yeah. I just did that. <laughs> so it only got worked downhill from there, you know? So, yeah. but as far as the senior living, you're seeing that go everywhere. Do you see people maybe migrating more to the South due to weather? Just curious. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've done some, some market studies. Um, you know, we have to kind of, plan for our, our years, uh, like kind of come up with a business plan and you look at different trends and, you know, uh, for whatever reason, there's still a migration from the Northeast to the Southeast and even the Southwest, um, you know, call it based on climate. But again, again, you hear about the, the, the climate change and I don't know, maybe we'll be all moving to the North again one day, I don't <laughs> know, but, uh, you know, right now there, there, that is still happening. I mean, here in Charlotte, it's booming. Uh, yeah. have, uh, I forget the last stat I, I read like over a hundred people a day moving to the city. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I was in Raleigh for years. Raleigh is booming. Uh, when I was in Austin, Texas, I worked in Austin, Texas for a number of years. Um, that city continues to explode and, and, and grow. So there is a migration happening, um, both young and older demographics. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, it's crazy here. I just did, um, not to refer back, I did a topic for the Illuminating Engineering Society here. And we did it just solely on um, multi-housing. Mm -hmm. The V process, the word we hate. And it's just funny from city, I've found from city to city too, how some city, uh, it sticks because of what they want done. And then in others, it's a huge VE process on the whole thing. So it's a, it's a funny how from city to city that changes. And I don't know if it's, I don't really know what causes that. Yeah. Well, you know, part of, I know we were facing this in Austin um, with different codes that we've put in place, but even in Charlotte and in Raleigh land, I mean, you know, there's only so much land in the city center or even close to the city area. So, you know, it's harder to find properties. And when you do, you're going more vertical than horizontal because you're mm -hmm. trying to fit more people on, on one piece of land. So uh, but then that, that's why a lot of um, like Charlotte is growing. The suburbs are growing leaps and bounds. And when I was in Raleigh, the same thing as well. And Austin, you know, the city of Austin is a great city. But, you know, to drive in, I was outside the city probably about uh, 35, 40 minutes. But on a bad day, it took over an hour to get downtown. So, you know, and we're facing that in Charlotte as well. So, yeah, Charlotte's a beast to drive around at times. I will say that. <laughs> Well, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I'm familiar with driving the, the Baltimore Beltway or Baltimore, the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore Beltways all right. the time. And, uh, you know, it was always busy. And, uh, you know, so and that was many, many years ago. So I guess it just comes with the territory. Right. 
I have one more question and then I would like for you, if you have time to expand on your book, but just talking about the age of internet, you know, um, we have designers of all parts that use it. It's easy to go on to kind of Google your look and to do it. Of course, the reps can call on you and we bring in samples and stuff. But do you ever utilize like other than the shows? Do you find it ever important to walk into? We know there's specialty places, you know, that will go. Do you find that um, useful to walk in or do you find that the shows do enough of that for you? Um. You know, it's funny. I, I, we, I think we all took a break from going to all the trade shows because of COVID, and and now sure. we're back and and whatnot, and you know, been been starting to venture out to to those again. Um, <clears throat> we have some great lighting showrooms here in, in Charlotte, um, mm-hmm. certainly uh, in Austin. I, I I went to showrooms in in Raleigh as well, and in DC too. So, you know, I think it, it is important to go out and see product and and see what you what you are specifying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do like, you know, I think we spent some time in, in different places during furniture market in High Point. We went sure. to the lighting showrooms and I think it's really valuable to do that. Um, so, you know, the lighting shows are good. I know a lot of reps, when they travel, they bring different product to our offices. And, yes. you know, it's only so, there's only so many fixtures you can carry. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's good to see things like that. But it is a lot of time and effort on, on your part to, to mm-hmm. do that. So, um, but I think it's important to see. So yeah, I do too. I, I wish that the brick and um, mortar, and I think they are starting to do more lifestyle, and then just lighting labs. I mean, I can bring a can in. I can bring you know, a linear system and show it for you. Turn it on, do that. But what an experience when you can walk in and actually see it on and off and dim, and and to do that and the technology because it's technology driven market now. So. You know, yes, we do bring our products in, but it's kind of nice to see them installed, which you do see them at the end of the, the project. Absolutely. I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit, if you have time, if you yeah. want to expand on something or a little bit about your upcoming book. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it, it's funny The kind of the idea hit me about a year ago. Um, you know, I've, I've been in this business a long time and I've, I've worked. I had I've owned three businesses uh, and, uh, you know, uh, been in design for for over 35 years now. And. Um, had the privilege of of serving uh, as chair of the ASID National Board of Directors, uh, heavily involved with the American Society of Interior Designers. Um, you know, I, I've had all these experiences, and um, but you know, I was a student once, so I was a student many many years ago in Washington D.C. And um, I've always enjoyed you know talking to students, and I've gone around to different universities and and done some talks on 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 things. But I started thinking about you know my career path is is kind of unique. I think a little bit of things were all, everybody's unique, but, um, you know, from starting my own firm to having business partners, to being involved with larger firms, um, to traveling to different cities and working in those different environments. So um, I started thinking if nothing more, just for me to remember all the different things I've done and the people I've worked with. So I'm kind of creating this, I call it, I haven't really come up with the title, but it's kind of my journey in design and mm-hmm. you know, how I persevered through three recessions and up markets, down markets, you know, all sorts of different things. And um, and here I am still in the profession. I still love what I do. I still like the fact that we get to create um, something pretty much every day, uh, get to work with some great people, get to see some things all over the country and travel. Um, through ASID, I was, I was able to travel internationally and do some things, which was great. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like maybe it's an opportunity for me to give back and to let people know, maybe younger designers or people that are in school that are coming up into the world of design, that, you know, your path uh, is going to change and it's not as linear as it used to be decades ago, um, but that's okay. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of um, evolve your career and continue to be make a make an impact and make a living. That's what we have mm-hmm. to do as well. Um, so the idea came to me about documenting and kind of creating a, a not a, a journal necessarily, but an idea of my travel and design throughout my decades of, of being involved. So um, I'm hoping I'm I'm, I'm I got to work a lot on it. I'll tell you, Shelly, it's a little <laughs> in process, but um, but I'm hoping to to get it maybe all wrapped up sometime in 23. And uh, and who knows, maybe if you want to have me on again, I'll talk about the book sometime. Or something. Oh, I would love that. You know, I mean, I do think for the younger generation, it's good to have some current role models. And like you said, three recessions and learning how to pivot 
not to discourage. Uh, that's my biggest thing, even in the cells. It's just learning how to pivot because we ebb and flow right. through these times. And, you know, in the no, don't give up, don't give up, yeah. you know, going forward. So yeah. that's, you know, I think that's, I would love to have you on when it gets done. I want to hear more about this as okay. you get into yeah. it because I know uh-huh. it takes time and you're already busy. Well, so, you know, but it, this has been kind of fun and, um, you know, I'm just kind of taking it piece by piece. And uh, it's also fun because I, I start, it starts bringing back memories that I haven't thought of in a long time. You know, when I worked for a small architecture firm in Bethesda, Maryland years ago, and I remember, uh, you know, it was all hand drawn. We didn't have computers back then. I saw how old I am. But, you know, sitting at my drafting table and drawing wall sections or details or things like that, you know, and um, it was it was cool. So I just. You know, again, it's a path. It's a different journey. And and uh, for whatever reason, I think my journey might be interesting to some people. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Well, nowadays you can get on there and use a SketchUp. And actually now most manufacturers where you can put the placement, you know, yeah. before you had to just have this imagination that that's what was like. So I'm like, wow, this is great. that. that well, I mean, oh. And to that point, you know, thank you for bringing that up. You know, we, we have some incredible technology, you know, artificial intelligence and um, all the different types of you can think. So now you can, you know, like you said, we can create spaces virtually and and have the lighting impact that in the virtual reality that we're looking at. So, and clients are expecting that now, especially on larger commercial projects. They're expecting a, a walkthrough of the space before okay. it's even built or fully designed. So um, having lighting as part of that is, is huge. So um, you know, hopefully you guys are, are continuing to involve your technology to allow us to integrate that into our artificial. Oh, absolutely. I have um, several yeah. manufacturers that I work with that actually have uh, Revit files and SketchUp files for, I mean, it's just so important, you know, specifiers would say before, if we don't plug it in there, we have no idea in the end what's going to end up in there, but if mm-hmm. they can visually see it, then it, it, it makes more sense. So and the last thing, and then I promise I'll let you go, but being that we're on this educational side and we are representatives and being that you are so highly involved with the ASID, do you, do you I guess, could you give any suggestions other than, I know we used to do a lot of tabletop trade shows and, you know, have local, not necessarily on the bigger, but um, on the lighting, I remember it used to be, and I need to make sure I, I'm right on this. I think you maybe had like one class that was pretty in depth about lighting going mm-hmm. through the education. So, you know, being in, more involved in ASID, are you seeing more ASID members really start to embrace the lighting? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I get in don't, their team. well, I don't know fully, but I, I, I think, you know, what I would challenge you all to do is lighting manufacturers and reps is go to the universities and see if you can have like a day long seminar or, you know, see if there's, if you can, you know, come in once a semester or twice or three times a semester and do a lighting class for the designers because, you know, again, there's a lot of different things we have to think about other than lighting and, you know, the form, the function, the materials, um, you know, code issues, egress issues, but lighting as well. So, you know, I challenge you guys to make yourself available to help, you know, educate these young designers and architects about how lighting can impact a space. Um, you know, I, I think, going on that you know having you all come to also our offices as well Mm -hmm. yeah you know I always like you know I know you have to talk product and and that's what you're there for because you have to make a living too and you got to sell product but at the same time I always like to couple that with you know continuing education units and what we can do to get educated on design uh, or whatever the topic is so but getting getting those uh, young designers early on and having mm-hmm. them understand the importance of, of the lighting design, I think would be huge. I think that, yeah, I think that they are starting to get a little bit more, pay a little bit more attention to it. So it is mm-hmm. good. So to CEUs, one thing I will say that has gotten really good about that is one thing COVID did do is forced a lot of people to do a lot more Zooms and a lot more virtual CEUs, which sometimes makes it easier. Now I like coming to visit the office because I like the relationships and getting right there involved in it. But um. Sure. I thank you so much for getting on. Is there anything you'd like to say here at the end? Do you think we covered no, it all? I, I really appreciate to... this. This has been fun. Um, thank I, I thank you. Can I ask well, you, I have, I have a California question, a really quick California <laughs> question. We always want to know. So we do a lot of um, multifamily housing here, as you can imagine, because the land is expensive. We have a lot of senior living going up, especially in the Sacramento surrounding areas, because there are a couple of big hospitals 
up there just in case. So we see that area growing. It, when you do uh, a package, even it doesn't even have to be light, including lighting your package. Do you have, is there a severe cut in the budget because the land and the, and the codes between the codes and the lands and, and the compliance is, mm -hmm. does it look different or is ours less robust than something that would happen in the East coast? You know, it's funny. So I, I'm actually working on a project in San Ramon, Ramon right now, California. Okay. Um, we have an office in Sacramento and Orange County and, and LA, but and I'm working with um, uh, this, uh, it's a hit to hair salon, actually, if you believe that. And the biggest challenge I found on on, on dealing with California is the permitting. Oh. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it, it's been the codes and the permitting process we've had to go through. Um, we have had a project in permit now probably for three months. And um, the same type of project, we're doing one in Massachusetts right now, they're already halfway into construction. And, uh, you know, and we pretty much permitted or tried to permit around the same time. So I'm not blaming California. California has some really great codes, but they're also very stringent and quite different. Lighting for California has kind of been leading the way in terms of, I think they require now a lot of residential interiors. If you have to use LED lamps, no more incandescent lamps at all for new construction, things like that. So, you know, to California's benefit, you guys are leading the way a lot in terms of energy consumption and, and lighting design, but but also um, the permitting process from our standpoint has taken a little bit longer. Interesting. Is that helpful, Melissa? Yeah. That is helpful. That is helpful. We always want, we, we kind of want to know, we're, we live in our own world out here sometimes. And <laughs> Um, because the codes are so different, takes a long time. And we, we, we always like to know how we are doing relative to the rest of the country or to other states in the country. So we love California, but it just takes a little bit more time. Yes. <laughs> patience, patience. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tim. Keep me, um, I'm sure I'll see you and we'll talk, but keep us, um, up to date with the book. I'm yes. Excited. Yes. So, um, and we would definitely like to have you back on and I guess have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Shelly and, and Melissa. I appreciate it and uh, enjoy talking with you both. Thank All you. right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into our podcast, Light Waves, a deep dive into all things lighting with a side of design. If we've left you wanting more, please hit the subscribe button or you can follow us on any of your favorite social or podcast platforms. Thanks again.